Hi, everybody. So I'm Jenna Axelrod. I'll be hosting tonight, but we're just still letting people filter in. So we'll wait, I guess, a minute or two, yeah, to let more people. I still see popping, popping heads. It's great. Great to see you all. Feel free to say where you're from before we all need to mute out. <laughs> Hi, what a lovely group. I'm gonna just admit. So Eleanor, maybe you'll tell me how long, I, how long we should wait. I, I'm hitting this admit button too. Is that helpful at all? Yeah, I got a couple of emails that I had to enter right away. To enter the link, so I'm gonna I'll keep my eye on the waiting room and keep popping people in. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Hello, Anna. <laughs> Hello. Hi, Anna. Good to see you. It's good to see you too. We, it's a, such a lovely looking group of people. And I'm very glad because Eleanor and Maureen and I are in Pari and the storm clouds are rolling in. <laughs> Which I don't know if how many of you have been here. I hope you all come soon, but the Wi-Fi is not always <laughs> reliable during the storms. So mm. you all won't lose connectivity with one another. So we have a we have thankfully some other people hosting the call with us. Um, yeah, I can't see how many of them. It's a nice looking group. So should think, we, do you think, I think we should? I think yeah? we should, we can go, yeah, perfect. That sounds great. So I have the honor of introducing Melanie Reen, who's gonna be taking us through this talk, which I'm sure you all know is the ancestors, the tree of life and intergenerational patterning. So Melanie, is a PhD and a Jungian analyst and supervisor with a practice in Cambridge. She's a senior member of the Guild of Analytical Psychologists in London, where she originally trained, right, Melanie? Um, and is one of the independent group of analytical psychologists as well. So I believe what's gonna happen is Melanie has a, a presentation that'll last for a little while and then we'll have group discussion and question and answer and hopefully Eleanor Maureen and I will be able to be here with you during that. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so too. Melanie, thank you for being here. It's the floor right. is yours. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you for inviting me. Um, I, it's, it's much appreciated and I hope that um, I hope that there's no interruption in the in the um, connections. Um, I'd like to say that that this paper, uh, before I start, is actually a work in process in process or progress. Um, it's had a number of uh, iterations and seems to change as I talk to people, either at events or just conversations, and it just moves on so it never seems to stay the same and a, a very good dear colleague of mine Jim Fitzgerald always says that with his papers that and he's written many many papers that they never stay the same they always move on um, but this one in particular is uh, well, it's particularly significant for me because it doesn't come out of a meeting that I had but it connects to a to a profound meeting I had some years ago with a natural healer, um, a Sangoma from South Africa. And we met in Zurich, although I had done some work in, in South Africa. And she was talking about the ancestors 
and um, that night it was a very interesting talk about her work as a sangoma and um, that evening or that night I had a dream about my mother who died some years before and it was it was lovely being able to, to speak to her the next day and said well here's the ancestors they arrived so it, it's with that in mind that, 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 I'll, that I'll begin this paper. So as a child, I often visited my grandparents, two very ordinary people. My grandfather spoke with a strong French accent, hence my subsequent love of the French. And my grandmother, despite the myth of the Jewish mother or grandmother, couldn't cook for love nor money. I won't go into the details about my own family history here, but I'd like to relate one small incident which has stayed with me all these years. When I was about seven years old, yes, I must be about seven or eight, my grandfather showed me our family tree, which he'd drawn on the family register page of a very large hardback Bible. The family tree that he'd drawn began with him and my grandmother. And at the time, it seemed strange to me even at the tender age of seven, that according to this tree, there appeared to be no, no other members of the family before my grandparents. The entire family seemed to begin with my grandfather and grandmother, just two people, Jack and Hilda. It was only in later years that I began to understand the reasons why we appeared to have no ancestors, no family, for by omitting the previous generations, my grandfather was attempting to hide and erase hurt, shame, and ultimately sorrow inflicted by the previous generations on one another and on their children, the next generation. I wonder in remembering this miniature family tree in front of this rather austere Bible, whether my apparently irreligious grandfather was attempting to create a deeper spiritual connection the genealogy contained in the Old Testament. By ignoring and eradicating from history the generations that had brought pain on him, he attempted to obliterate the pain and instead connect us by, directly to the greater genealogy of the, or the family tree of the Old Testament. Family tree is a depiction of a family, not only illustrates the linear generations of the family, the great grandparents, the grandparents, the parents and the children, but also the branches, the uncles and aunts, the cousins, second cousins, half brothers and sisters, step families and inter or intrafamilial marriages. As more branches are discovered, so the tree becomes bigger, stretching out to encompass or potentially encompass a community a village, a town, a nation, and even, as is described in Ezekiel, to represent the power of the king, or a king. In particular, he's referring to the king of Egypt, who was compared to the cedar of Lebanon, surrounded by water, with his trunk higher than all the trees of the field, and with all the birds of the sky nested in him, all the beasts of the field bred beneath him, and all the great people sat in his shadow. I am reminded here of an image from a dream where under a large tree whose branches spanned out much like that of an old Lebanon cedar were gathered hundreds of people all standing under the branches to be protected from the rain but who in this dream replicated exactly the patterned width of the tree. The simple family tree has its roots in the world tree or the tree of life, which appears in numerous ancient and current cultures. The details of these archetypal trees vary depending on the culture, but one of the oldest recorded accounts of the world tree is of Babylonian origin, about 3000 to 4000 BC. It is said that this tree stood at the center of the universe which was thought to be at the mouth of the river Euphrates. 
There are also suggestions that, that I've come across recently that the halupa tree, and I don't know if I pronounced it correctly, the halupa tree in the myth of Inanna from the earlier Sumerian period is also the world tree. I won't say more about this now as it's very recent in my own research, so I can't be more specific, but it is something that I'm hoping to develop. The tree of life influenced much of the Celtic, Anglo-Saxon and Nordic traditions, as well as those in Southeastern Europe and Asia. Many pre-Christian religions across the world, many species of trees have been connected with the journey to the underworld, the gate of death and the soul's transition from this life to the next. Jung says of the tree symbol, the commonest associations to its meaning are growth, life, unfolding of form in a physical and spiritual sense, development, growth from below, upwards, and from above, downwards. The maternal aspect, protection, shade, shelter, nourishing fruits, source of life, solidity, permanence, firm rootedness, but also being rooted to the spot, old age, personality, and finally death and rebirth. In the dream mentioned previously, the dream tree can be seen to represent the maternal aspect, extending her branches to offer the, that protection, shade, shelter, nourishing fruits, source of life, solidity, permanence and firm rootedness for those that shelter under her. The more masculine phallic tree, and I'd like to actually show some images here, so bear with me while I just organize myself to do this. Can everybody see the image? Yeah, it looks I great. Is that okay? Looks beautiful, yeah. So the more masculine phallic tree can be seen in the tree of Jesse. Jesse was not only the father of the most famous king of Israel, King David, but he is also mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus and thus the mystical family tree of Jesus. The tree of Jesse derives ultimately from the prophecy of Isaiah, who says, and there shall come forth a rod out of the root of Jesse, and a flower shall rise up out of his root, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of fortitude, the spirit of knowledge and of godliness, and he shall be filled with the spirit of the fear of the Lord. I have a couple of other pictures here of the tree of Jesse which I think are particularly interesting in that you'll see that the tree actually comes out from different parts of the body. So in this one, it seems to appear as if it comes out of, of the stomach. And this one, it's much closer to the heart region, if you can see that. And then in the last one, it's actually coming out of the groin. And I wonder if each of these different, the different ways in which these pictures have been drawn actually give different archetypal energies which arise from this, from the root. All these pictures were taken from the website of the Archive for Research in Archetypal Symbolism. I don't know if any of you know it, but it's a, it's a fabulous um, website to look at. And to quote from the website, they say, cultural, ethnic, and geographical roots link one with ancestral origins and the deep strata of evolutionary process and its sacred psychic matrix in sacred time. Family trees of material and mythic substance develop from such roots, like the biblical root of Jesse, and continue to grow with each generation Likewise, the roots 
of an individual extending to layers of personal and archetypal ground. There is an interesting story about a particular tree in Sweden, which is connected with the three famous Swedish families, Linnaeus or Linne, Lindelaeus and Tilliander, all of whom were named after a three-stemmed lime tree, also known as the Linden tree. It is said that when the Lindelaeus family died out, one of the main branches died. When the daughter of Linnaeus died, the second trunk ceased to produce leaves. And when the last member of the Tilianders died, the tree was left with no leaves at all. What is particularly interesting to note is that Carl Linnaeus, who died in 1778, was the Swedish botanist, physician, and zoologist who formed the modern system of naming organ organisms and is known by the epithet, the father of modern taxonomy. The Linnaean system classified nature within a nested hierarchy, similar one might say to a family tree of species. In previous images, we have seen the tree arising from the masculine, the tree of life as the phallus, coming out of the body of a man. Although if we return to the tree as the mother symbol, I'm going to just share again. Can you see that? Okay. I don't yet. Oh, there it's. Oh, is that there? Yes. Yeah. So if we return to the tree as the mother symbol, Jung says the tree of life is a fruit bearing genealog genealogical. Oh, sorry, genealogical tree, and hence a kind of tribal mother. Numerous myths say that human beings came from trees, and many of them tell how the hero was enclosed in the maternal trunk, like the dead Osiris in the cedar tree, Adonai in the myrtle tree. The world tree connected directly with the tree of life is, in the words of Eliade, a tree that give, lives and gives life. It is directly connected to shamanic practices, where the Goldie from North East China and the Dolgan from the Tungus from Siberia say that before birth, the souls of children perch like little birds on the branches of the cosmic tree, and the shamans go there to find them. Eliades goes on to describe the Osmanli Turks who believe that the tree of life has a million leaves and on each one a human fate is written. Each time, each time a man dies, a leaf falls. In Kabbalistic texts, the ancestors are sometimes represented in the form of a plant or a tree, with the tree of life being the tree of flowering souls which God's, God holds in paradise. In relating this text, Howard Schwartz says of the tree of life, that the angel who sits, and this isn't an exact example of it, but this comes from his book, and I particularly, it comes, it's the front cover, which I particularly like. So the angel who sits beneath the tree is the guardian of paradise, and the tree is surrounded by the four winds of the world, from this tree blossom forth all souls, as it is said, I am like a cypress tree in bloom, your fruit issues forth from me. And from the roots of this tree sprout the souls of all the righteous ones whose names are inscribed there. When the souls grow ripe, they descend into the treasury of souls, where they are stored until they are called upon to be born. From this we learn that all souls are the fruits of the Holy One. So having introduced the connection between the world tree, the tree of life and family trees, I return to my own rather small family tree, which my grandfather proudly showed me when I was seven. 
Little did I know at the time that this rather diminished family tree with all its omissions and cancellations would come the prima materia of my own work, which is eloquently echoed by my Michel Trudeau in his own paper, Redeeming the Lost Voices of the Ancestors. He says, it is not that I started the journey and then found the echoes of the ancestors inside, but the other way around, the voices echoing inside my soul with a call to start the journey. Our family tree roots us in our familial histories and connects us to our ancestors. The families we are born into, the families which raised us or gave us away, the births, the marriages, the love affairs, the betrayals, the deaths, all are part of our stories and of the family myths that we carry with us, sometimes without even knowing the myths ourselves. And it is often the half hidden story or the story we were never fully told that is likely to be expressed or given voice in our own lives. It is as if, in the words of Selma Freiberg, in every nursery there are ghosts. They are the unremembered past of the parents uninvited guests at the christening. Indeed, as in the fairy tale Briar Rose, it is the uninvited guest who curses the baby. Freiberg continues, the intruders from the past have taken up residence in the nursery, claiming tradition and rights of ownership. They have been present at the christening for two or more generations. While no one has issued an invitation, the ghosts take up residence and conduct the rehearsal of the family tragedy from a tattered script. These ghosts, these personal ancestors, continue on in our own lives, casting their spells, their curses and their wishes upon us. Whether we knew them or not, they remain with us and within us. These hidden family members whose stories, shrouded in death, continue to influence our very being. In his novel, A Suitable Boy by Rick Bikram Seth, and I, many of you may know, may know the book, um, Bikram Seth describes the stretch of an individual's influence after death into and through the future generations. He says, Mrs. Mahesh Kapoor was dead and felt nothing. This ash of hers and sandalwood and common wood could be left to the dons to sift for the few pieces of jewellery which had melted with her body and were theirs by right. Fat, ligament, muscle, blood, hair, affection, pity, despair, anxiety, illness, all were no more. She had dispersed. She was the garden at Remnebus, her home. She was Venus, her daughter's love of music, Pran's, the son's asthma, man's, another son's generosity. She was the survival of some refugees four years ago. The neem leaves that would preserve quilts stored in the great zinc trunks of Remnebus. The molting feather of some pond heron. A small, unrung brass bell. The memory of decency in an indecent time the temperament of Bascar's great-grandchildren. Indeed, for all the minister of revenues and patience with her, she was his regret. And it was right that she should continue to be so, for she took, should have treated her, he should have treated her better while she lived. The poor, ignorant, grieving fool. This vivid passage encompasses the essence of the life of Mahesh Kapoor, and in this one paragraph captures the complexities of the qualities, emotions, and energies that are left behind. The regret of a husband, temperaments and illnesses inherited by preceding generations, the non-familial lives touched by the now deceased person, and the energies and patterns that survive physical death 
and are transformed in animals, plants, and trees, and contained in inanimate objects. As a slight aside, this is why wills are so important. For they do not consist merely of the distribution of money and assets, but are the bearers of the gifts passed down after death. A mother's wedding ring, a father's watch, a grandfather's book, a wooden box made by a great grandfather, a favourite semi precious stone kept by an aunt. It is as if, by touching the object, the owner, the deceased, has left an indelible mark which permeates the outer membrane so that the object becomes synonymous with the memory of the dead person. The object becomes a talisman, imbued with an, with an ancestral spirit, sometimes with an ancestral gift, and at times with an ancestral curse. Witnessed in families where relationships have been bad or difficult, and where after death, those still living want to be rid of anything connected with the deceased. The object belonging to the dead is contaminated, and by connecting with it, those still alive would be contaminated as well. The object needs to be got rid of, cast out. But it is not just our family members whose memory or influence is reflected in our lives. As Bikram Seth illustrates, we are also the descendants of others who have touched our lives, including our teachers. Of course, in a far larger sense, we are all descendants of previous generations of the human race. As Jung says, the whole anatomy of man is an inherited system identical with the ancestral constitution, which will unfailingly function in the same way as before. However, for the rest of this talk, I would like to focus on the near ancestors, the parents, grandparents, and possibly the great-grandparents as well, as well as others who have died more recently. And it is in relation to these others, and I'm actually thinking here um, of examples of, 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 of analysts, psychotherapists, martial arts teachers, such as Tai Chi, tai Chi and Qigong, but also our teachers from schools or colleges or universities where the connection to the teacher influences us so profoundly that we inherit an essence, a quality, which in turn we pass on through our own work with others. The call to connect with the ancestors and to appreciate our heritage is illustrated by the fascination in family histories, family trees and genealogy. genealogy is represented by the ever-increasing numbers of resources and websites related to the subject, such as Ancestry.com, Find My Ancestor, Irish Ancestors, and there's a host of others to name but a few, as well as a television program, which you may not, which in the UK we have, and I may be in the States as well, but it's called Who Do You Think You Are? And so for those of you who are not familiar with the program, each week, somebody in the public eye seeks out information about one of his or her ancestors. The person may travel through different countries, speaking to historians or archivists, searching out documentation that will provide information about the ancestors' lives. Often, and I assume for good television, the celebrity cries, and that might just be me being a bit cynical, that celebrity cries about the sad life that he or she discovers about the ancestor. Despite the potential for real consideration and understanding of how this ancestor connects with the living person now, in the episodes that I have seen, the program only shows the ancestor's life and amid, amidst the connections to the living. Thus, for me, it lacks the depth and appreciation of the connection to our ancestors and of its potential as the Freeman material. In a number of cultures and traditions, the ancestors are revered and remain an inextricable part of life. In many traditional African religions, death does not alter or end the life or the personality of an individual, but only change causes a change in its condition. 
This is expressed in the concept of ancestors, people who have died but who continue to live in the communicate in the community and communicate with their families. For example, in some African communities, the dead are buried next to or under the home. I understand that after apartheid, the new South African government attempted to move small communities to larger towns so they could provide amenities such as electricity to everyone. However, because the connection with the ancestors was so strong, with many being buried around or under the home, the villagers refused to move, as moving would have meant abandoning the ancestors, leaving the living rootless and the ancestors disconnected. In other cultures, as Don Franz discusses, the corpse is kept in the house for a month or longer after death. To make this possible, the body is treated with a temporary embalming means. The survivors drink, eat and play in its presence. Here, Don Franz is referring to the Torijan people from South Sulawesi in Indonesia, who do not consider a person as dead until they have the burial rite. Instead, what we might call a dead person in the West is for the Torrigans a sick person. I have some pictures here, which I'd just like to show you on the Torrigans. Can everybody see that? Beautiful. Yeah. So here we have, I think this is the grandmother, or the grandfather maybe the grandfather, actually part of the family. Um, child here looking, but they, they're just, it's just family life going on around. Second one shows the, um, how they bring in food to the person who is sick and so they can eat and leave the food um, for them to eat. This one I particularly like because this is this is the photograph of the woman behind her. Oops, that was it. I know. I actually thought I had another one there. There's another picture which I thought was included, which is why I went on where. The children, there's a child who's, who's, who's died or sick, as the Torrigans would say, who was sick. And all the children are around, around the sick child. It's, it's actually a, a moving picture, so I'm sorry I didn't show it. In Madagascar, the Barra community bury their dead as a double metaphor of sexual intercourse and birth. Metcalf and Huntington say, the funeral procession resembles a burial by capture, as men enter for the first time the house of many tears and take away the coffin over the tearful protests of the women. The young men then run, carrying the coffin in relays towards the mountain of the ancestors. A group of young girls, often with their hair and clothes disheveled, run to catch up to the coffin bearers and to distract and detain them from their task. Often the girls intervene physically to stop the journey to the tomb, and there ensues a tug of war over the coffin as the girls try to pull it back to the village. When this fails, the girls may run ahead and line up across the boy's path. The boys then charge, using the coffin as a battering ram to penetrate this female barrier. This sexual symbolism is continued at the tomb itself as the coffin is poked head first into the small hole at the mouth of the cave. The dominant theme becomes that of birth with the deceased entering the world of the ancestors, head first like a fetus. In central Madagascar, every seven years, Bones of the dead are exhumed and reburied as a means for the living to connect with their dead. And I have a short video here about this, which I'd like to show you if I'm able to remember how I do it. So please bear with me.
if you can't see this, can any can everybody see? Can somebody tell me whether they can see the picture? Yeah, we see the blue frame. Okay, that's great. So I'll continue. The ritual begins with the opening of a crib, a small, dark, musty room. It becomes crowded fast. People bump up against corpses. A single candle is lit. Family elders attempt to be sure who is whom among the dead. The dead are carried into the daylight one by one. Every society has its customs regarding the dead an interplay between those who are and those who were. In the central highlands of Madagascar, ancestors are taken from their tombs and lifted onto the shoulders of the living, who then dance with the bones of the dead. The ceremony is called a famadian. Tears are discouraged. This is a joyous time for family. The shrouded bodies are sometimes sprayed with perfume or splashed with sparkling wine. The reason we do Fama Diena is to honor the dead and to show our love. It helps the family who's left behind to remember their ancestors. Usually a family holds a Fama Dien only once every five or seven years. Hundreds of guests are sometimes invited and they must all be fed usually meat and rice, accompanied by beer and rum. Future generations will keep doing this. I have a son. When he grows up, he will have children. After I am gone, he will continue the tradition and it will go on and on. The family will help each other keep the tradition alive. Many Malagasy believe the boundary between life and death is not impermeable, that the spirit of their ancestors somehow passes back and forth. To them, the Famadian is a time to inform the deceased of the latest family news and ask them for blessings and guidance. Before the dead are returned to the tomb, they are carefully re-wrapped, the new shroud going over the old one. <laughs> Family members run their hands over the outline of the skeleton. <laughs> it is a time when elders tell young children about each ancestor and why it is so important that these forebears be remembered, that these dead never become lost in the world. For the New York Times, this is Barry Barak. Okay, is that to stop the sharing okay? Yes, perfectly, it was beautiful. In Western culture, the grave on the one hand connects us to our ancestors, and at the same time as Robert Pogue Harrison says, is the primordial sign of human mortality. It domesticates the inhuman transcendence of space and marks human time off from the timelessness of the gods and the eternal returns of nature. I shall just read that again because it's quite complex. Primordial signs of human mortality. So the grave domesticates the inhuman transcendence of space and marks human time off from the timelessness of the gods and the eternal returns of nature. The rituals we use when someone has died help us to both grieve the dead and in so doing releases us from them and them from their earthly connections so that they can become one of the ancestors and we can remain in life. 
On a very personal note, after my father had died, I had a dream some while later in which I woke my father out of a deep sleep. He was very irritated with me. I mean, he was incredibly irritated. I remember it very clearly and told me to let him sleep and to stop disturbing him. My father's death had been as a, as a result of a hospital error, which left the family with a deep sense of guilt and anger. The dream of my father very clearly told me to let him go, to stop waking him by continually rehashing my own sense of guilt and anger at what had taken place in the hospital. I needed to let him rest in peace or sleep in peace. Marie Louis Louise von Franz, a colleague of Jung's, when talking about the dead in dreams, says that it's not always possible to know whether one should interpret the dream personally or objectively. She gives the example of being asked to interpret a series of dreams which involved a dead person. In all but three of the dreams, she analyzed them personally. However, for the remaining three, she connected them to the post-mortal life of the dead person. When Jung was also asked to interpret the same sequence of dreams, he also identified the same three dreams as of the dead person himself, rather than symbols of psychic contents to be found in the dreamer himself. Also, I can't help but reflect on the symbolic similarity of our Western tradition with that of searching for and or finding out about our ancestors and compiling our family trees with the barrow's rituals of exhum exhumation and reburial. It seems to me that both are a way of connecting to the bones of the dead and to our ancestors. We might also consider how family portraits and the many photographs that we now take may also be the carriers of these bones. What is particularly pertinent here is that these bones, these dead, these ghosts of ours hold stories and memories which, if ignored or kept hidden, may make themselves known to us in difficult and unfortunate ways. And I'll turn here to a quote from the Bible, which I'm sure many of you will know. The Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy and forgiving iniquity and transgression and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon children unto the third and fourth generation. I shall return to this a little later. In my work, I have seen a number of people whose grandfather or great-grandfather saw active service in the First and Second World Wars, where the extreme experiences of battle possibly resulted in what we would now call post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. The traumatized soldier returning home often exhibited rages, were violent, dissociated, might sit in silence for long periods of time, relate gruesome war stories to his children, all, all of which leaves an indelible mark on the family. If the complexes and unconscious psychic adaptation aroused in the children are not recognized and understood, then they in turn may be passed down to the next generation. This type of family patterning has been illustrated and discussed in research undertaken with families of victims, sorry, of victims and perpetrators of the Nazi regime. In the research, the experiences of the parents or grandparents during the Nazi atrocities are directly reflected in the unconscious processes and psyches of the children and grandchildren. Whether it is the horrific experiences of concentration camps, which are kept secret to protect the children, or a fear for children or grandchildren of what their parents or grandparents had done during the war, or a deep shame about one's family history and one's own DNA, the range and depth of psychological wounding in the next generation cannot be underestimated. I wonder if any of you have seen the film Hitler's Children. I, I actually think it's on YouTube, so you may want to have a look at it. It is a film of interviews with the descendants of SS, of the SS, 
and in particular those that win Hitler's inner circle. This film is particularly interesting to watch in light of our discussion today because it illustrates the guilt that can be carried through the generations. Two particular stories stand out for me. That of Goering's grandniece and nephew who decided to be sterilized in order not to give life to other Goerings. The other is Heinrich Himmler's great niece, who in the film denies the concept of genetic inheritance, i.e. bad blood, but went to Israel and married a man whose family had been survivors of the concentration camps. This is the power of heritage. Joanne Whelan Gersten, a Jungian analyst who was working in, in Germany up until recently, says in her paper, in her paper, Holocaust Victims and Perpetrators, such an immense shadow as that of the Third Reich is naturally hard to bear. How does one learn to accept, work through and integrate such a huge collective shadow? One solution we find again and again is identification with the victims of those times. People may cultivate Sorry. People may cultivate relationships with the former victim class, even to the extent of marrying a Jewish or a black person, or even of converting to Judaism. The liberal Jewish community in Munich, for example, is composed to a large extent of converts to Judaism. Others try to overcome the shadow complex by denying any aggression in themselves. Practically the entire post-war generation became pacifists. Even today, we often find a regression, a repression of, let me say that again. Even today, we often find a repression of aggression and authoritarianism. Such denial is used to create distance from any connect, to connection with the Nazi world. I refer to these examples from the Holocaust because the wealth of material, which helps us to understand the effect of collective trauma on individuals, their families, and the wider population. And there's been more recent studies, um, one by Fanny Brewster, who's an um, African-American Jungian analyst in, in the States on the um, effects of um, slavery and uh, current generation. Angela Connolly, in her paper on the collective trauma experienced during the Stalinist period in Russia, says that it took her some while to appreciate the depth of trauma in her work with clients in Russia. And quoting from Nadezhda Mandelstam, she says, every section of the population has been through the terrible sickness caused by terror, and none has so far recovered or become fit again for normal civic, civic life. It is an illness passed down, so it is an illness passed to the next generation, so that the sons pay for the sins of the fathers. Here, of course, this refers to the earlier quote I gave from the Bible. Jung initially recognized the unconscious connection in families during his work on the word association test. When discussing Dr. Thurston's work on applying the word association test to 24 families, Jung says, hidden conflicts between the parents, secret, secret worries, repressed wishes, all these produce in the child an emotional state with clearly recognizable signs that slowly but surely, though unconsciously, seeps into his mind, leading to the same attitudes and hence the same reactions to the environment. In a letter to Fanny Baudich Katz in 1918, Jung comments that often it is more than just the parental influences which are important. He says, the quality and disposition of the whole family and of the ancestors play a much greater role in the creation of the child's disposition than the individual's disposition of father or mother. It is this work of Jung's that led the Jungian analyst Renos Papadopoulos to conclude that through his discovery, that's Jung's discovery of a familial disposition, 
Jung anticipated modern family therapy. To understand these family patterns across generations, family therapists developed the idea of the genogram, an adaptation of the family tree, which enabled family therapists and other psychotherapists or analysts to uncover intergenerational patterning, sometimes in surprising ways. Developing a genogram or family tree enables conversations to emerge about the family conversations which a per person may not have had before. Such reflections and conversations initially draw out common but important facts, such as dates of birth, gender of children, marriages, ages of marriage, divorces, ages of divorces and deaths. One of these areas of names, which I'd like to touch on a little here. Parents spend much time over this very important act psychologically it is not just one's name but the meaning of the name the intentionality of the giver which is so important and if the name is a family name passed down from generation to generation then it not only holds a direct connection to the ancestors but may also contain within it secret hopes and unconscious associations for the bearer this is described eloquently by the analyst Errol Shalit when he says, and then the woman whose father was possessed by the torture he had suffered, who until his premature death tortured her, his only child, whom he had given the names of the deceased to carry as his hope for the future. In many traditions and communities, there is a custom of naming a child after a relative who has passed away. This keeps the memory alive and in a metaphysical way forms a bond between the soul of the baby and the deceased relative. In Tanzania, children are also frequently named after living relatives as well, especially grandparents and great grandparents, and it's specifically to connect them to their ancestral heritage. Jung says, not only are the ancestral spirits supposed to be reincarnated in children, but an attempt is made to implant them into the child by naming them after the ancestor. In some cases, it is the local ancestral spirits that force the naming of certain children after them. The power of a name is also reflected in the Egyptian myth of Ra, when Isis permanently robs the sun god of his name and thereby, thereby takes away his power. Another intergenerational patterning is that of significant dates. I know of a family where the grandfather died on his own birthday. His son married a woman whose birthday is on the same day as his, and one of the grandchildren had a birthday on her own birthday. Now one might say that these are all pure coincidences, but I think you will agree that even if one can't necessarily make sense of this patterning and its meaning for the family, it is interesting and worth noting. On this, I'd just like to briefly quote from the poet Lucy Hamilton, when she writes about her mother's death and the connection to her sister Annette, who died many years before her mother. And it's two lines that Hamilton, Hamilton writes. She says, then, with a sense of wonder and sadness, I realized that you died on Annette's birthday. So as one moves further into the genogram, other stories emerge about the family, such as emigration or immigration, the child's birth, who got what after a divorce, heroic deeds to name just a few areas. The conversations progress and this may take time, semi-veiled secrets or family shame begin to be revealed. These may be connected to parental affairs, grandparents drinking, gambling, violence, abuse, madness in the family, suicide, children given away at birth, adoption. All these and many more become part of the tapestry of the genogram. Slowly as the stories unfold and are told, the genogram takes shape until a picture of the family and its ancestors is drawn. 
complex structure which illustrates the patterns which, together with dreams, not only guide the analytic work, but it can be but the can become the dream of material itself. It is in this context and through the genogram or psychological family tree that the more profound and deeper connections to the tree of life becomes apparent. There's much more to be said about this subject and I had just skimmed the surface, but I would like to finish with two quotes. Here I want to show a final picture. The first quote is from Jung, which goes, When I was working on the stone tablets, I became aware of the fateful links between me and my ancestors. I feel very strongly that I am under the influence of things or questions which were left incomplete and, un and unanswered by my parents and grandparents and more distant ancestors. It often seems as if there were an impersonal karma within a family, which is passed on from parents to children. It has always seemed to me that I had to answer questions which fate had posed to my forefathers and which had not yet been answered. Or as if I had to complete or perhaps continue things which the previous ages had left unfinished. And as Claude Landsman, the French filmmaker known for the Holocaust documentary film Shoah says, time has never stopped not passing. Shall we read that again? Time has never stopped not passing. Thank you. Thank you. Time has never stopped. Wow. That was really beautiful, thank you. I wrote down a lot of notes of things I'm gonna look up, including Ra was robbed of his name and stripped of his power at the time. I didn't well, know that. Yes, I, I, I won't go into the details of it now, so I've got to remember it all, but yes, it's a, it's a really interesting myth. Yeah, I've never heard that. I'm really excited to look, look that if up. You, if you email me, I can send you the reference. Thank you, I will do that. The reference so that you can have a look. And your pictures are so, I mean, just stunning. So people, we have, I guess we have about a half an hour left for group discussion, comments or questions. If anybody is moved to, to expound upon anything, I'll look for your physical hands as well as the little button at the bottom that you could press to, to technologically raise your hand. And you can always chat to me if, if, um, if it's not clear how to do that. It's that little reaction button at the bottom. Normally I'd be sitting in the same room as Eleanor who could look for me too, but I'm gonna miss the, um, I see Eleanor. You're muted if you were talking to us, Eleanor, you're muted. Sorry, we're having some, some Wi-Fi issues. You know, I was really intrigued by the video you played that people were using it as an opportunity to update the ancestors. Absolutely. That was fascinating. Beth, I'm sorry, I see your hand is up. Yes. I, so Melanie, that was absolutely fabulous. Um, I'm going to watch the video of this over and over again. It just touched so much. Um, and I have a curiosity about the passage of tradition or angst or things that flows through the culture, but not just through the family. So is it, is there a similar kind of 
process that would apply to more some kind of group or collective Absolutely. as well as specifically genetically can you, can you say about that no that that you it, it is and i said that's what jung was talking about when he was talking about the collective unconscious because of course we're not just from our, our families we, mm -hmm. we are there's a much larger group that we are part of mm -hmm. um and i think that it 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 also comes through you can see it in um society when i'm thinking in terms of what i was talking about earlier the the guilt that the Germans felt. Now, not all of the parents had been involved in the Holocaust or in, in with Nazis um, or grandparents, but that collective guilt was there and still is there, mm -hmm. still there, and, and it 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 is inherited. It's almost that it's inherited in the earth in the soil yeah um, so yes of course absolutely it's, it's there rather than just being the genetic okay. and i'm thinking too about cases where it's not exactly just cultural but think about times in the world where scientists in various places who aren't talking to each other happen upon the same discovery or Absolutely. something that passes now, is there some intention now is that an archetypal infusion that's coming or is there some source of intentionality behind wh whichever oh, these forms think, are yeah there is i think there is it's, it's certainly um i think there's a lot more talk at the moment about the ancestors since i've started doing work on this paper it's popping up all over the place I'm, I'm, not, I'm noticing it, whether it's just me that's noticing it, but, but I notice that people are talking about it more. Um, I think something is in the zeitgeist, something is in the, in the air, and it's, it's going on in the collective unconscious, so somewhere underneath there's things going on and it pops up, it rises up, and one can see it in dreams. Sometimes I'll be working I'll be working on something personally myself, thinking about something, I'll have been reading about something. And suddenly people will come to me with dreams about that particular subject. Mm. Or a colleague will start talking about it. And okay, we can talk about it as being synchronicity, but it's something that is going on in the collective unconscious that then emerges or begins to emerge. So yes, scientists do do that. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Mel, Thank you. Uh, Mel, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, this is uh, Mo Cohen down in Totnes, Judith. Yes, hello. Uh, hello. Hello. How are uh, you? Um, are we both I'm really great, and I'm really happy that Richard um, found the time to let me know about this. Um, okay. We won't get into a family uh, discussion now, but no, no, to we see won't. You. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and um, so, just apropos things popping up in a zeitgeist. Um, so I've been exploring uh, family narratives through theater for my PhD at the moment. And um, one of the things that I would like to ask you in the context of your paper is if you have anything to say about Donald Trump, if you have anything to say about what's happening in America in generally with the rise of the right and also the Black, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, yeah, so just, you know, if you have any thoughts at all, and if not, that's fine too. Oh, I have lots of thoughts. Um, <laughs> whether they're, that's a huge subject. And there have been some very important, there's been a very important book written about Trump, Jungian um, analysts writing about Trump in the States, um, which if you contact me, I can give you the reference for. Um, that is very much, I think, about the shadow. Which, which takes us into another area. Um, of course, it's all connected because everything is connected. Um, the Black Lives Matter movement is, is incredibly important. It's, it's, if you, 
can get to see Fanny Brewster talking at any time. She will talk about the heritage of slavery, the inheritance and what it does, what it means. And I, and I wouldn't even dream to touch on that because it's not my history. What I would be talking about would be coming from it from an outsider's perspective, having read Fanny, but also knowing something of the black community, having some connection with the black community in the States. Um, but I wouldn't profess to talk about it. I don't think it's for me to talk about it. Um, but yeah, I could say a lot about Trump. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you could say, I, sorry to interrupt you, Mo. I feel like maybe you should have a family discussion since the, it's the ancestral theme here. <laughs> well, it said it's Richard's family. So my family by marriage. Amazing. Yeah, really lovely. I am interested in um, not so much a conversation about Trump because I'm personally grateful that I don't hear his name as often, but I would be interested to hear um, how you would bring the shadow into this conversation, unless you think that's too divulgent from your paper. No, I don't mind that. I don't mind moving, moving it on. Um, whether I'll be as coherent as I'd want to be, I'm not sure, but... Um, Well, I liken what happened in the States to what happened in Germany. And if one is not aware of one's own shadow, one gets caught, can get caught in the collective shadow. And when there's a collective shadow, somebody emerges from that who holds, who, who leads it, and who, who um, becomes the head, the central figure of that shadow of the time. And people are drawn in, it's a complex, it's a, it's a shadow complex, so that um, Individuals who are not aware of their shadows get caught, get caught up in the groundswell. And it seems as if it's as if something tremendous is happening. And that happened in Germany at the beginning. I mean, Jung got caught in it initially and was. Um, Eric Neumann was very angry about Jung's own description of what he thought was happening in Germany. Jung retracted it. So even he got caught in this groundswell of feeling and emotion. Mm. Um, and that's what happens. And that's what can happen. Wow. So I think, I mean, that's from my perspective. That's from where I'm sitting. And I, I think that that's what was so dangerous and is so dangerous about Trump. I don't think he's gone. And I don't think we can, we, we can think that just because Biden is there, it means it's the end of Trump, because I don't believe it, it does. Um, those energies, those, those forces are still there. And yeah. until we find a way of working with those and acknowledging those and bringing those more into the, the, the collective, um, I think they will rise again in some way, somewhere. That's, that's, sorry, that's a rather long explanation, but. No, that's beautiful and intriguing. I'm now I have to Google how Young was caught up in. Oh, you need to, you need to be aware of that because there's been some awful books written about it and there've been some very fine books written about it. So okay. again, I can send references. So I, you know, I, I know some of the books that have been written, I'd say actually don't go there. Um, okay. But there's some other ones. I mean, Jung's, um, the, the Jung um, Neumann lectures. No, so the Jung Neumann letters have reference to it, hmm. which have been published. And they're interesting. That's great. But there's also other things. I can certainly send references. 
So I see Sarah had her hand up and Bina, I see that you're next too. Sarah. Thank you, thank you. Hi, Melanie, thank you. That. Um, I, I loved every, every element of your paper. Thank you. Really rich and uh, fascinating. Um, and um, I suppose what prompted me to want to say something was when you started talking about uh, people being aware of their own shadow, um, I wanted to connect that to the genograms um, because it's something I, I, I'm, I'm a psychotherapist and it's something that I do use with clients and um, it like, like you say it, it offers such insight into into so much about them um but and, and where they're they're coming from but there is something when when you talked about the shadow I, there is something about when 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 clients are are sharing the information in order for us to create the genogram there is something about them becoming more themselves absolutely there is something about them connecting with their ancestors when they when they when they share that information yeah. that is a little bit like them finding their shadow and i hadn't really thought that before until you started talking about that and yeah. and i love that because it explains why it's not just about information finding it's about them connecting with themselves well absolutely it also frees them yeah in a paradoxical way, it frees them because once they know, I mean, I've, I've sat, I have some people who actually go and do their own research and discover things and bring it back. And as they discover things about their family, they're free from this unconscious patterning hmm. that goes on wow. so that they don't have to carry it anymore. They don't have to act it because it's there. They can see it. They can see what they've been doing. And it might be that they've been carrying that shadow around with them, and it, it, it there there is a there is a a real bringing it into the light. Absolutely, in, absolutely. In them to be become themselves. Absolutely, yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you. Anyway, oh, it's very exciting that you're using the genogram as well to relate yeah. to it. That's really nice, lovely. Wow, thank you for sharing that. That's so interesting. Bina is. Did I say your name right? I have you still there, muted. There, there I am, I unmuted myself. Yes, that is the correct uh, pronunciation. Thank you. Uh, I'm interested in following up on the comments about Mr. Trump as an American with dual citizenship, also Italian, um, and who is now in Italy, uh, but still practicing as a marriage and family therapist and not a Jungian per se, but very interested. Uh, I would like to ask, in the Jungian thought world or conceptual world, what does one do productively about um, this prevalence of shadows being focused into a Trump or a, yeah. or a whoever? Yeah, yeah, when it, when it takes over. It's a question many people have asked me. I don't have the answer. All I feel is in my own way, in my work, but the more of us that become more conscious of our shadow, the less likely we are to get caught in it. And that's my work. That's what I feel my work is. Not all of it, but, but a lot of it. I know. Well, not... the, the problem is that I'm not, and you're not going to see most of the people who are going to uh, be caught up in this, uh, in this tremendous flooding river. Um, of shadows. Um, it, no, I, in, in the Jungian thought, is there any conceptual reference to what one can do at the larger level? There's, there's a very moving paper that was written, I can't remember his name, it was a Jungian analyst in Berlin before the Second World War when, when Hitler had invited Oh God, what was his name? The Span the um, Italian leader. Mussolini? Mussolini, thank you. Thank yes. you. I'd invited Mussolini to, to Germany. And the same evening, Jung had been invited to give a talk in Berlin. Now, all things were cancelled apart from this talk. 
and Jung was giving his talk, it was full, full of people. And the parade was taking place right outside. And as the noise got louder, all they could do, all Jung could do was stop talking until the sound went off. And then he said something like, and this is not an exact quote, we had to let it pass by. Now, sometimes, I'm not saying that that's what we have to do, but sometimes we have to wait and see, something might emerge. But that doesn't mean to say, I don't think one shouldn't take action, <laughs> because I do, I do think, you know, but sometimes, and I know this in my own work, when something really difficult is there in the room, I can't do anything with it. All I can do is wait until it passes by, and then we can make sense of it. And that's what I would hope now Trump is not there at the moment, that more sense can be made. I don't think it's enough to just undo everything he did. But I mean, I, I'm wondering, for example, excuse me for interrupting, but I'm wondering, yeah. for example, if uh, an overt recognition of the uh, unhappy, that's a large term, uh, not nearly large enough, uh, sentiments, the energies in, in the shadow driven people, if, if some acknowledgement of their, you know, would that increase their awareness of it? Would that help potentially? I think we all have to acknowledge our own shadow. But I mean, helping them on see I by think, reflecting it back to them, helping. I, know. I think we have to acknowledge our own shadows because until we can see that we're not all good and we don't hold it all, we don't hold the right, the, the correct way of thinking. We also have a large shadow, they carry it. Yes. For us as a collective. Okay, thank you. So I don't, that doesn't answer what do we do? Because I don't know is the answer to that. I don't know what we do. All I know is we need to look at our own shadows and that may be the collective shadow as well. Thank you. Okay. You make me wonder if the counter response is also a shadow response to in some Absolutely. Is that what it, it can become? It's, it's interesting that I think it was Von Franz who talked about um, men in prison who have committed terrible crimes. Their dreams are being very helpful, of being very good of being a, totally the opposite to what they did in their outer lives. And that's their shadow. Wow. So they're living, well, they're living the shadow, but they're also, that is that other side to them that they're not connected with. Wow. So I don't know where that takes us, but Yes. Couldn't you say as well that Trump is carrying my shadow and that's why it's so important to I don't think it's your shadow. shadow. I wouldn't say I wouldn't be so direct to say it is it's carrying your shadow because I don't know. We our shadows are, are different. We when we get caught in the collective shadow, it's because we've not worked with our own shadow. We don't recognize our own murderous feelings or our own really unpleasant sides, which we all have. Yeah. Well, I can just say that I can pin a whole lot of anger on him and make him responsible for a whole lot that's going on in the world around me. And if he weren't there, where would I put that? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Hmm. That's a very good point. Thank you for that, actually. I will be thinking about that one. Alina? Alini, sorry. Yes. Um, 
Melanie, thank you so much. I mean, it's, uh, I'm so deeply touched um, and so many levels. And um, there is something about the roots here for me um, in relationship to the trunk and to the branches uh, that I must remember. Um, and so it, about the question on, on the shadow and working on our personal shadow, I keep remembering that um, there is the, the communicating vessels so that the personal shadow is closer to the collective shadow. And once we consciously deepen into that, perhaps that then there is communication, there is something that gets distilled yes. and, and it drops into the collective shadow. And so there is like a, a some kind of freeing that happens because we each individually work on our personal shadow. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that's exactly, you've got it in the, that's exactly what I was trying to say. Thank you. That's exactly yeah. right. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you, how you how you presented it, you know, how you presented it, uh, 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 bringing the tree and the and the uh, uh, the root system and the growth oh. root system, and then the growth and the and the uh, 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 trunk and the crown. That that correspondence is so poignant for me, um, and and brings me to to say this. And that the, the, the treasure then also sometimes is at the root of the tree. Uh, and then that's, there is a quote there, a Jung yeah. quote um, that to really work with, yeah. with the, the volatile element that perhaps is, is there contained in each one of us working. Absolutely. Yeah, oh, I'm so grateful. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that. I see Wally's written in the chat about the various tree images and I felt the same way. I really wanna look and touch and play with those some more and understand the Jesse tree. Is that what you- the Tree of Jesse, yes. The tree Jesse. of Jesse, okay. Coming from more than one central point in the body from the same era in time? Is that, were they all- well, They weren't all done at the same time, no. I don't no. Think they were all done. I think they were done at different times. I'd have to have a look. But it's, it's just the way the artist depicts them, which, which strikes me, what were they trying, what was that artist then saying about this particular tree that they were painting? In fact, it was it was Richard who first pointed that out to me. He said, oh, look, they come from different parts of the body. Hmm. It was really interesting. Really beautiful. I just, we only have, you know, we have less than 10 minutes left. And I just wanted to say, I know not everybody likes to speak out loud in front of a group. And yet some people may feel that they have something they want to say. So you, I see you, Paul. And just to finish my thought quickly, if anyone wants to text, you know, chat me privately, I'm happy to represent any questions that people don't want to say out loud. Paul, I see your hand. Sorry, you're still you're still muted. It looks like I'm not. Is it, I don't hear you yet. I'm sorry. Paul, I'm gonna hit a, see if I can help unmute you. Uh, Perfect. I should be working. <laughs> Perfect. My question has to do with shadow. Jung's simple and not so simple use of shadow to cover a tremendous territory. And I don't know Jung very well, but when I think of shadow, to me, 
It's Plato in the cave. There is a light shining and it is obstructed. Uh, and that causes a dark shadow. Uh, can you sort of go into that? I, you know, when we talk about multiple shadows of Trump is a person who to me projects all the time his shadow. He projects all kinds of things. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he does. And it is the interaction of all of the shadows that is can be very confusing to me. Right. It is confusing, and it's, it's not. The point about Trump is that he's whiter than white. He portrays himself as being whiter than white. So he doesn't see his own shadow. Hmm. And that's the danger. He doesn't see his shadow. And the lighter the light, the darker the shadow. Or the brighter the light, the darker the shadow. You see it in, in I'm, I'm saying this tentatively without reference to anybody in particular, but some religious groups which are what which are holier than thou contain can contain a huge shadow it's a similar type of thing and we've seen it recently i won't go into details but you know one can see it in religious in particular religious groups if everything is so wonderful it's so high and so close to God. Where's the devil? Where's, the, where's that shadow underneath? It will emerge. It will come up. And when it comes up, it comes out in such a force. Jung once said of a, it's, it's a lovely story. He was at a conference or something like that. And he, there was a man there who was absolutely, he came across as perfect. And Jung followed him around all weekend, and this man was just perfect. He was a good, good man, kind, and good, and all of those things. And after the conference, this man's wife asked to consult Jung, and it was her who carried the shadow, of the, of, of this man's shadow. She had it all. Wow. So. Hi, so I have a question that came to me from the chat. I don't want to interrupt though. That oh, was a profound moment. I just am aware that we've got limited time. Um, the question is if you could please, uh, could I please ask how this relates to family constellations work? Well, that, that, that's, that's, I, what, oh, actually, that's asking, leads me to ask a question. Ooh. Are they talking, is this person talking about the specifics of family constellation work, which I don't do? Or are they talking about um, the work with the, with, gene, with, with the genogram? There's a difference. I don't do constellation work. Family oh. constellation work. Uh Oh, hello, it's Christina. I asked the question. Oh, hello. Um, I, I, um, I, was, I was just um, just interested in what your thoughts were about family constellations because the, geno the traumagram and genogram were in your um, presentation. So I was just wondering how you saw family constellations fitting in with the work that you, you just presented. Well, I don't know enough about it, to be honest. I know I have a couple of colleagues who've, done, who, who've trained in, in family constellation work. My, my training was initially in family therapy, which is different. Um, I, I understand that it's much more about getting the person to talk to those people in the room. So they bring in the, the, the family constellation into the room, all the people who are dead. So it's, it's, it's using the imaginary. Um, that's not what I do. That's that's not the kind of work I do. So I don't know what I what I 
think of it. I don't know enough about it. I don't think that helps, Christina, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think that actually is very helpful because we've had some speakers who would never say that they don't know something and I appreciate hearing that, frankly. We have time, maybe if you if you don't mind, Melanie, is it okay for one more question? Yes, of course, yeah. Okay. I see, Alini, you, you had another question it looked like, yeah? It's not really a question. Well, it's, it's a question, but I wanted to say when you're speaking, Melanie, about the what's happening in religious groups, I'm just um, thinking of what you said in your presentation about ancestors and teachers as ancestors, and therefore how um, the shadow gets um, perpetuated through lineage somehow and encouraged to be perpetuated. I mean, the, and on some level. And I'm wondering if there is any anything you you may say to that. Especially, I'm thinking in a relationship to some clients of mine. Yeah, I, it's exactly what you said. It. I mean, I think if if you're talking about lineage in terms of our teachers, yeah, then what we may pick up is is that positive side. What we don't necessarily see is that is the more negative side, which might get acted out and that might be pushed into the family. Um, and by not seeing it, we we can carry it on. We can carry on that ignoring of the shadow in a particular area, mm. and and that's that can be difficult. That that's I think that is so important in our work, and it's certainly important in my work. Is knowing Jung had a shadow, knowing that that the people who trained with Jung had a shadow, and sometimes when you see them, you know that they did. You can see it. I mean, Jung Jung decided that they had a they had a club. In, in Zurich, where all they did was fight. So he, all these Jungian analysts would get together and they would have great art, they would have huge arguments. They would argue among each other and fight and they would, people would they shout at each other. And Jung said, yeah, this is what we need to do. This is the, this is the shadow coming out. We need to do this. Oh, wow. Young, um, great club. <laughs> And you see it in Jungian groups. I mean, you know, set up a Jungian training and before you know it, it's split. And also one group has gone in to start off another training because they fall out. It's, 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 it happens. It's the shadow. And when we blame each other for carrying the shadow, it's the other person's fault. Ah. But perhaps the arguing has to happen. It Absolutely. has to have a space to happen because otherwise it will come so potentiated and can split apart. And yeah. will come out much more in our work. So, yeah. Well, thank you for that question. So we are, we're only three minutes over time. So if anybody has anything they... <laughs> they feel they need to bring into the conversation. If not, I just want to thank Melanie for her beautiful talk and the community for the lovely interaction. Yes, I would like to thank you all actually for your lovely comments and also for the really interesting conversation afterwards. It's, it's, it's made me think, and of course, there'll be another iteration of my paper now. <laughs> we'll move on. It's so beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And just to invite you all to the next call is Saturday. Is that right, Eleanor, for the, the next session of what is consciousness? So we will see you there or we will see you at the next community call, whatever works for you. Thank you Thank all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. -bye. Thank you, Eleanor Thank and Maureen. You. Thank you, Eleanor. Bye. Bye-bye, everybody. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Bye-bye.